questions?
through its Neighborhood Services Clearinghouse and the Richmond Urban Enterprise Association had a program for that for owner-occupied residences to, to uh, show that they were based on economic need. What they found was that property owners were not always willing to provide the documentation to show that the program was not extensively used. There were a number of uh, properties that did get fixed up that way, but not nearly as many because it was based on being able to show economic need. Thank you. I had a question for Tamar. Um, wondering if you had advice on how we fix a broken tax sale system. Indiana has multiple ways that different counties can choose to run their system. And in Delaware County, where we are, it's particularly more, it feels like, particularly more broken than around Indianapolis. But I mean, the county has such little revenue, you know, changing anything, they're, they're scared to death as well. So what sort of evidence can we provide to them to say, hey, let's change the system together, make it, you know, you'll have less properties to process. Um, but I just didn't know what we could show them to prove something. That is the hardest part of the work that we do because it is so incredibly political and nobody wants to give up their money or power or their vested interest in the tax process. So it is, I, I don't have a great answer for you because it is incredibly hard. I will say, depending on what, what specific part of it you think is most in need of fixing, there, there are resources out there that do provide evidence. One example is if the tax sale of the tax certificates, if that's a huge problem, you know, we, we did a study, it's now, it's probably, it's probably four years old now, but I, I don't think the basic underlying points have changed very much, which I'm happy to send your way, which did look at uh, tax lien sales in Rochester, New York, and just how bad the community impacts of those were. Um, so that's the kind of evidence that, that can be useful from other places. But I, I will say, I think it is, you know, We've, we've seen many places change their code enforcement programs. We've seen many places change their land bank legislation. Uh, we did do some work in Louisiana where they reduced the redemption period for vacant and abandoned properties, which was a pretty big change for them statewide. But it's really hard to tackle that system. I don't think that means we should stop trying, but <laughs> it's really hard. Assessments are made, I know, here in Indiana on properties 
based on what you do to it to improve it versus what you do not to improve it, which has created a set of incentives that disincentivize people to do anything to their houses. And we end up with a situation like we now have here in Richmond and all across the country where um, multiple landlords on the lower end of the landlord spectrum do nothing because they do not want the property to go up. And all they are really doing is destroying the value of their homes, the homes around it in the block, the neighborhood, and therefore reducing the entire uh, cash flow stream to the entire community. Would anyone like to address that? <laughs> That's an area I have not worked very closely in in, in Richmond yet. I know that's an area that we need to be looking at. It's just not an area we've been putting a lot of focus on. That's really an age-old issue. We've all heard these stories about why certain properties, why, why the, the myth that people didn't put closets in their homes because they get taxed on the, on the closets or they, they would have Window, windows functioning of doors because they get taxed more doors. That's been with us for, for centuries. Uh, even the, the, the mansard roof, supposedly, with the dormers was a way of, of, uh, of claiming a roof instead of an extra story. That supposedly, I don't, it's all, a lot of it's mythology, but there, there is the, the ongoing problem of, of uh, people who do defer maintenance because of the fear of rising property taxes. Um, I know there are some specific things that address that. This is, doesn't relate to homes, but uh, uh, the past two years, we've had legislation that, that helps uh, owners of historic barns. It takes barns off the tax rolls um, because the, the, many of the barns we have are not being used. And if a farmer or a barn owner repairs a barn, their, their property taxes go up in the barn. Well, now they can remove those from the ta local tax rolls with one application. Um, there are certain communities that have abatements uh, for improvements. Unfortunately, uh, we lost. There was a. There was a. a, a uh, Little used provision in Indiana law that, that went away this year, and not everybody knows this, but but uh, up until this year, if you had a, a, a property and you uh, improved that property for five years, the the increase on your assessment would be cut in half. For five years. Well, that even that little incentive is now gone. So from a statewide level, we're, we're kind of we got to start over with that. But I think there, well, the rest of it can happen down at the local level. Colin, could you maybe talk a little bit about the um, after we have appraisal, since that was kind of really directly to that gentleman's question about if we do get someone who wants to make repairs, how do we ensure that we get them, you know, the lending ratio based off those repairs and not the, you know, forty thousand dollars that the house is actually yeah, we often get asked uh, regarding the after rehab appraisal, uh, generally the question, well, is this going to make my taxes go up? Um, essentially, the bank is assessing that and the, the appraiser is assessing that. So uh, that's separate from what the county or the city uh, assesses for tax value. So to my knowledge, we haven't had a property go th through our program and then all of a sudden their taxes are higher. Um, the uh, way that market values run and from what I've seen in our county um, versus appraisals is that market value, so to speak, with the county or with the city is much, much lower. And often the comps are much, much lower than the individual property. Um, the benefit of the way that the appraisal is done, uh, what number one requires a walkthrough of the property. So although the property might be in a low mod census tract or might be in an area that's um, economically depressed or housing is not in its prime, the appraiser is required to do a full walkthrough of the property. And then the, uh, of course, with us going to the property and with our viewpoint of addressing code and safety issues first, uh, and then in terms of improvements, basically the pretty project second, we want to ensure that if the appraiser gets to the property, they're seeing not only that the homeowner is improving the property and doing those shiny projects, but also if there are code or safety issues involved, that those are also being taken care of. Um, because the appraiser can really grind to a halt if the appraiser gets to the property to assess the value 
uh, for the project being a kitchen, but then sees that there's a hole in the roof. So we want to ensure that those projects are included as well. So that appraisal type is, is very helpful in um, the scenario of an undervalued property. Uh, to my knowledge, again, it, it doesn't affect any sort of taxation on the property as a result, at least not where we're located. I have a question for Scott. Uh, your grant program for the upstairs living, is that only available for people looking to purchase a vacant building or are existing owners allowed to do it and move into it? Existing owners were eligible. Um, it, it was just, we were able to put together a, a limited pool. And so we've been able to have five programs so far and are kind of holding that sixth one that could be uh, eligible or available for an existing property owner. We're just trying to determine whether there's a, a strategic project coming together that this would be an important, important incentive to have available. Thank you. So maybe I could comment to, to Philip's question. As we, as we move forward with trying to put up, put together similar sort of programs, that could be another level of incentive to build into this, work with the assessor's office to see if we can, can cap uh, some sort of improvement rate for that. That's not something that we've got in place now, and it's a great opportunity to move forward. Um, and unfortunately we can't 
give them any money back towards that grant repair if they've got to do it. And that's something that, again, unfortunately, our neighbor buys on, and we can't do any reimbursement on. Yeah. I make, make a little, you know, say a word in favor of this new grant program. Obviously, this was not what we had hoped for over the course of years as we were trying to, to uh, make Indiana's state a commercial rehabilitation tax credit viable. I think many of you over the years have, have heard the, the, our pleas for help in, in changing the minds of our legislators. It, it just didn't happen. We, it was our, our top priority for, I think, seven years at the State House. Indiana had probably the nation's uh, worst tax credit program. This is for income producing properties. Uh, folks from Ohio used to live here. It's what, 150 million? Is that what your commercial rehab cap is? It's, and they were complaining because they had a cap on there. So the state of Missouri, I think, I think still has no cap on the tax credits. Our, our cap was $450,000. 150 million, 450,000. And that's, that's not even a project in most states. So we have, we have developers doing a lot of work right now in Cincinnati in particular, to Indianapolis developers who, who are taking advantage of both the federal rehab credits and the, the state rehab credits. Um, <coughs> so it was the idea of the chairman ways and means to, to take, as we were trying to reform our state tax credit, and, and we became so close for a couple of years, but as you know, in the legislature, if you have one or two key leaders who oppose something, they can kill it. And that's, that's the power of seniority, the power of committee chairmanship. And that was our bane of over time. And uh, those people will eventually retire. Um, they're getting about that point. But until that time happens, I, I think the falling back on the grant program, which is, again, the idea of the Chairman of the House, the Chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, um, is, is actually a lot better than what we had. Because we had, in theory, $450,000 in incentives. And that's, that's nothing. So we thought, well, we're not, we're, this program is never going to help the big projects, the big multi-million dollar projects where they're not going to Cincinnati to do it. But where does Indiana need a lot of help? The Main Street level, the, the small scale uh, individual uh, sole proprietor uh, businesses. And so this program can, I think, make a huge difference. We have a 1.2 million, does that, this year. And our, our goal, and one of the reasons that it was so important that this first round of, of applicants is of high quality and so glad that we exceeded the demand is so we can go back to the legislature next year and say this program uh, is in great demand and look at the difference it's making. So stay tuned for this because we will need local advocates to increase the plot of this, this uh, program. Again, 1.2 million in, in compared to what other states have by way of credits is, is, is the drop in the bucket. But it's, it's better than the 450,000 we had. It just will, it will just attract a different kind of project.
And I think we'll leave it to you to wrap this up. Oh, we're done? Any other questions?